second half of the video lecture on chapter 19, which covers German composers of late Baroque, primarily Bach and Handel. Where we left off in class on Friday was Bach and his keyboard music, and we were talking about uh, the well-tempered clavier and then Goldberg variations. So the next thing I want to mention is the Art of Fugue, which was written in 1741 um, during the last period of Bach's life. Uh, we've talked about this in class. The Art of Fugue was essentially his effort, Bach's effort, to show that there were many different things you could do when you were writing fugues, and basically he was a master of all of these different fugal techniques. He wrote a theme, wrote a, uh, a single theme, and then he proceeded to write 18 canons and fugues based on this theme. Now, he died before he completed this work. Um, there are simple fugues, there are double fugues, there are stretto fugues where the sec next entrance of the answer or of the subject is always before the previous one ends. There are crab cannons, which are basically like musical palindromes where lines are the same uh, backwards as forwards. Um, his last fugue is actually a quadruple fugue with four different subjects, and one of those subjects spells out Bach's name. You have to understand in German, um, B flat is represented just by B. So if you're reading something in German, musical text in German, and it refers to the note B, what it's really referring to is B flat. So B flat, A, C, and in B natural in German is H. So if you're reading German musical text and you see someone refer to the note H, they're talking about B natural. So B flat, A, C, H, or B, A, C, H is B flat, A, C, B natural. So it's Bach's musical signature. There are other composers throughout history who have used musical signatures like this, most notably, in my opinion, Dmitry Shostakovich, who we will talk about in the spring. So the art of fugue, uh, comprehensive fugal writing. The fugues that I gave you guys for your extra credit um, assignments, which no one bothered turning in, were the first four fugues from the art of fugue. Here's that theme that he used for the Art of Fugue. Um, it's in D minor. So we start by outlining a D minor triad. Do, Sol, Me, Do, Ti, Do, Re, Me, Fa, Me, Re, Do. So that's your theme, and he uses this um, as the basis of all of these fugues. Chamber music. Uh, Bach composed 15 solo sonatas for a solo instrument with continuo accompaniment. Six violin sonatas, six flute sonatas, and three sonatas for viola da gamba. Now, viola da gamba, I think I've mentioned in class, is similar to a cello in its range and in the way it's uh, bowed and played. But the shoulders of the instrument aren't rounded like the shoulders on a violin. They're sloped like the shoulders of a double bass. If you look at contemporary double bass, that's actually a member of the gamba family. It is not a member of the violin family. Bach also composed 13 pieces for unaccompanied solo instruments. Six sonatas or suites, partita is another word for suite, for violin, six suites for cello, and a flute partita, unaccompanied flute partita. Uh, some of you may remember when Charles Morel played in a seminar a few weeks ago, he played the uh, partita, the flute partita that Bach had written, transcribed for saxophone. All of these solo works, by the way, the violin sonatas, the gamba sonatas, the violin partitas, the cello suites, the flute partita, they're all considered to be absolute masterworks, and they're at the core of the solo repertoire from the Baroque era, era for performers. The cello suites are performed on many instruments. I've heard them played on violin, viola, saxophone, trombone, tuba, trumpet, French horn, they're transcribed for everything because they are amazing pieces of music. Orchestra music. So Bach, in addition to the solo music and the keyboard music, he also wrote some of the greatest orchestra music of the period. Uh, first and foremost are the Brandenburg concertos. Now we've talked about the concerto grosso. Bach's six Brandenburg concerti are concerti grossi. In other words, for a small group of solo instruments, the concertino accompanied by a larger group known as the tutti or the ripieno. Um, 
They're all in the three movement structure that Vivaldi popularized, except for the first concerto. They all utilize the Ritornello form that Vivaldi used in his concerti. So they're very much Italian in their influence. They're nicknamed the Brandenburg Concertos because they're dedicated to the Margrave of Brandenburg. A Margrave is a noble office similar to a duke or an earl. Um, the dedication itself is, is very obsequious. Um, it's basically Bach putting forth that I'm, a, I'm but a humble servant and everyone knows that you know your, your highness, the Margrave of Brandenburg, is the world's foremost expert in music. So I hope you accept these as a simple tribute and do not be, judge them too harshly because of what a genius you are. Um, all of which, of course, is utter nonsense, but that's the way that the uh, musicians treated the nobility. He flattered them. Uh, people think that maybe the Brandenburg and Charity were written as a, uh, a job application, basically. He was hoping to maybe set up opportunities for himself. In addition to the Brandenburg Concertos, Bach also composed four suites for orchestra. An orchestra suite is just like a solo instrumental suite that we talked about. It's a collection of movements that are inspired by different dances, some of them in compound meters, some of them in simple meters. Um, these four orchestral suites, which are uh, amazing orchestral music, uh, both have Italian and French influences. Remember, the suites that we've studied um, developed in France initially. Now, cantatas. We've used the word cantata quite a bit uh, throughout this class. Even at the beginning of the Baroque, we were talking about the Italian sacred cantatas that they wrote that were in Latin. But when we think of cantata today, we think first and foremost of Bach and of this new form of cantata that developed around the year 1700. Uh, Erdmann Neumeister, who was a, uh, a poet and a religious scholar, came up with this idea for this new style of cantata, and he used the Italian term for it. We talked about this in class today. Basically, the texts that Bach selected were a reinforcement of the day's gospel reading and sermon. Um, they combined features of the chorale, the four-part chorale, because there is choral singing in these cantatas. There are movements that are for chorus and orchestra. Solo songs, because there are recitatives and arias. Sometimes there are orchestral movements where just the instruments play. So Bach's cantatas required strings, winds, and continuo for the orchestra, a choir, and vocal soloists. Bach liked this style of writing, and as I said, he wrote in excess of 250 cantatas, over 200 of which, approximately 200 of which we have the music for today. Um, the churches that he composed for in Leipzig, in addition to any other music that he wrote, needed 58 cantatas a year for performances at different services. Uh, so early in his career, Bach wrote a lot of new cantatas, and then later in his career, he recycled a lot of the cantatas he had written earlier. He also composed about 20 secular cantatas, that is, using this cantata format only on secular themes, some of which he then repurposed as sacred music just by substituting sacred lyrics. You can think of it as kind of Baroque version of um, contrafactum. You probably can't see this very well in the video at all, but this is actually an autograph page from one of Bach's cantata scores. And Monday in class, I'll show you Bach's signature. He used to sign all of his works at the end. In addition to his cantatas, Bach wrote Passions. Now remember the Passion is a very popular form of the Historia, of the sacred drama. Two Passions that he composed still survive to today. The St. John Passion and the St. Matthew Passion, they use, similar to his cantatas, they use uh, recitatives, arias, choruses, chorales in a block four-part setting, and an orchestral accompaniment. The tenor soloist in these Passions is kind of the narrator, and he narrates through the use of recitative. As I've said in class before, but it bears repeating, basically the story gets advanced in the recitative. That's where you tell the story, because it tends to be syllabic, which means it's easy for the audience to understand. It also tends to be simpler in the accompaniment, so there's nothing distracting from the text. And you can cram a lot of words into a short space 
in a recitative, the arias being much more uh, musically complex and involving a lot of melismas is where you emote. Basically, you tell the story in the recitative, and then in the aria, you talk about your emotions. Finally, uh, the last major choral sacred work that Bach wrote um, is his Mass in B minor. It's actually a setting of the Catholic Mass, which he assembled from a lot of previously written music right at the end of his life, uh, just a year before he died. He adapted music from earlier compositions as well as just recycling some of it, and he composed newly composed a few sections as well, mixing the Stili Antico, remember that is the style of German counterpoint that looked back to Palestrina, and some more modern styles. But the Mass in B minor, it's an absolute masterwork. You see complete performances of it. The Philadelphia Orchestra did a complete performance of the Mass in B minor, I think just last year, or maybe two years ago. All of these Bach pieces have amazing vocal parts. They also have very tricky uh, orchestra parts. So that pretty much wraps up Bach. Um, in class on Monday, we will listen to a movement of his cantata, uh, several movements of one of his cantatas, to show you just the different styles um, that he was writing in with his recitatives, arias, choruses, and his orchestral writing. Bach was a master of all of these styles, and as I've said in class, he wrote in every style of the late Baroque except opera. He's probably, and I can't even say that, I was going to say he's probably best remembered for his sacred music, but he's not really, because his secular music, his Brandenburg concertos, his orchestral suites, and his solo music, as well as his non-sacred uh, organ and keyboard music, like uh, the well-tempered clavier, are absolutely the pinnacle of music. Bach's music really serves as the cornerstone of the modern repertoire. It sounds funny to say that, doesn't it? that a guy who lived 250 years ago is the cornerstone of the modern repertoire. But we really think about the vast majority of the music that we perform and experience as Western classical musicians begins with the mid-Baroque. Begins um, A lot of it begins with Bach and moves forward. Bach's contemporary, George Frederick Handel. Handel was also German. He was actually born in the same year, in the same month, in the same region of Germany as Bach was. He lived nine years longer, 1685 to 1759. I've said in class that I'm not going to require you to memorize dates of very many composers, but there are a few that I want you to memorize. Bach is the first of those. Bach was born in 1685, died in 1750. That's a date that I think is very important that you know. Handel, 1685 to 1759. There are a few composers we're going to talk about down the line who I think their dates are important to know as well. Most composers, it's just important to know when they composed. Few composers, I think it's important to know their dates. Handel was very well traveled. If you look at his contemporaries, Bach pretty much stayed in Germany his entire career. Yes, he did have influences from other parts of the world, but for the most part, Bach stayed in Germany. Um, Vivaldi more or less stayed in Italy. Rameau more or less stayed in France. Handel was born in Germany, where he initially studied. He studied organ, harpsichord, and counterpoint. Then he traveled to Italy when he was 19 years, no, yeah, 19 years old. He traveled to Italy where he spent four years studying opera. He lived in Italy from 1706 to 1710, um, met some of the leading Italian composers of the day, and really began to absorb Italian styles. So. He studied organ, harpsichord, and counterpoint in Germany, then moved to Italy where he studied opera and absorbed Italian style. Very famous portrait of Handel, again, with music, in this case sitting at the keyboard. Not wearing a wig, though. A lot of famous portraits of Handel, he's wearing one of those big powdered wigs. Handel wound up moving to England where he lived uh, the majority of his productive life in England. Uh, he is best known for his Italian operas and his English oratorios. And we'll break down what that is in just a moment. Um, his major works, oratorios. He wrote about 25 oratorios, the most famous of which are Messiah, Saul, Samson, and Israel in Egypt. Although he did write Judas Maccabeus is another very famous one. 
but he wrote over 20 oratorios in English, and he wrote about 40 Italian operas, uh, probably the most popular of which is uh, Julius Caesar in uh, Italian, Julio Cesar. Um, he also wrote about 100 cantatas in the Italian form, not the German form that Bach used, but in the Italian form, concerti, over 40 concertos, over 20 trio sonatas, solo sonatas for various instruments, more keyboard pieces than we can talk about, and two major orchestral suites, water music and music for the Royal Fireworks. Remind me on Monday, uh, I want to show you a video of a really fabulous performance of his orchestral music. So, in 1710, Handel moved from Italy to England, where he became the music director for the Elector of Hanover. That was a position. The Elector of Hanover was the heir to the British throne. He later, in 1714, became King George I. So Handel moved up in the world. The guy he was working for became the king in 1714. So Handel's salary got doubled. He more or less lived in England and worked in England from 1710 until the end of his life. He did travel to continue to travel, though. In 1711, Rinaldo, which was Handel's first Italian opera, was staged, and it was a big success. This led to Handel's major, um, the major thing he did for the next period of his life, which was compose Italian operas. He wrote four more operas in that decade. And then in 1718, the king actually established an opera company called the Royal Academy of Music. There is a Royal Academy of Music today, but that's actually a conservatory. It's a music school. It's called the Royal Academy. It's in London. In those days, for just a few years, the Royal Academy was an opera company that produced Italian opera, mostly written by Handel. Handel wrote a lot of the operas. He formed the orchestra. He hired uh, a castrato, remember castrato, uh, singers who were castrated before puberty, so they were basically male sopranos, who was a very famous singer. He got engaged by this company as well. Very successful for a time. Some of his most famous operas were composed for the Royal Academy over the next number of years. As I said, Julius Caesar is probably Handel's best known. What are these operas like? Well, the plots are based on frequently on the lives of Roman heroes or people from Roman mythology, you know, so, or biblical for that matter. Well, that, that's really more the um, oratorios. Uh, some of them are even based on stories about the Crusades when the Christians were in the Middle East um, killing people. Uh, one of the big characteristics of Handel's or, uh, operas is he wrote two different kinds of recitatives. This is important. A recitativo secco, secco literally means dry. So a dry recitative is a recitative that has a very simple accompaniment, just the basso continuo accompanying it, and it's very speech-like. You can tell your stories very well in a recitativo secco. A recitativo accompanato, a company recitative, has the entire orchestra accompanying the recitative and tends to involve a little more emotion the orchestra will emphasize emotional stuff that's going on in the uh, recitative. So a recitativo secco, dry recitative, is very, very simple, very basic. You can think of it as being the purest recitative. A accompanied recitative is kind of a step closer to an aria in, in that it's commit, uh, transmitting emotions. Handel's arias were usually da capo arias, so A, B, A, sing your A, sing your B, then go back to the beginning, back to the capo, and repeat it, this time ornamenting quite a bit. Um, there was a Italian opera at this time. They would write arias for specific singers, and the singers demanded a certain number of arias. Sometimes it was written into the contract that a singer would be given a certain number of arias within the opera. This is where the term prima donna came from. Prima donna literally translates as first lady, and this was the uh, female role that had all of the, uh, had most of the arias and had the best arias. Now, another thing that came along this time is the term coloratura, 
Today, we use coloratura as a modern use of just for soprano, a kind of soprano who tends to sing very high and very fast um, ornamental passages. That came from this time. The term coloratura meant these very, very fast technical parts of ornamentation that were written. It eventually turned into an entire voice type. Eleven years after its founding, the Royal Academy dissolved, went out of business, basically. So Handel formed his own opera company. Um, he was a musical entrepreneur. As the founder of an opera company, he was responsible for everything. He wrote a lot of the operas that they performed. He also had to secure the hall to perform them in, hire the musicians, the singers, and the orchestra. He had to commission people to create the sets and the costumes, and he had to advertise, he had to do all of that. If he sold enough tickets and made money, well, then he could stay in business. He continued, uh, Sensino, the castrati, stayed with Handel after leaving the Royal Academy, and he had some great successes with this company. In 1733, uh, another opera company began direct competition with Handel, hired Sensino away from him, they tried to outdo each other, and they eventually both went broke. They both went bankrupt because they were spending more and more money to try and outdo the other opera company. So what did Handel do after his opera company went bust? He turned from Italian opera to English oratorio. Oratorios have similarities to cantatas, and there are differences. First of all, oratorios are based on Bible stories. They tend to be two to three hours long. It's a complete concert would be an oratorio, and they're intended for concert performance. They were not written to be performed in church. They were written typically to be performed in a concert hall for paying customers. Two to three hours long, uh, utilizing recitatives, arias, choruses, ensembles, so duets, trios, quartets, and even some uh, orchestral interludes where just the orchestra plays and the singers get to rest. Handel used the chorus in kind of a new way for English music because he used it in the way he learned in Germany. So this was something new that he brought between the Lutheran choral music, the four bar crowds and stuff like that, and the English anthems. If you think all the way back to William Byrd in the English anthems, he kind of managed to make something new out of this. His choral si uh, style is less based in fugues and straight up counterpoint than Bach's. Bach's choral style is very, very contrapuntal, much like most of his writing. Handel would use fugues, but he also used homophonic textures. Um, the most famous example of which was we talked about is the Alleluia Chorus, which is homophonic, and then in the middle there's a fugue, and then it goes back to being homophonic again. Handel's first oratorio, he wrote in 1718, is titled Esther, by, uh, Old Testament story. It was premiered in London in 1732. That was successful enough that it continued his composing. We're going to listen to some movements from Saul, another Old Testament um, oratorio that Handel composed in 1739. We'll listen to uh, uh, a recitative and a chorus in class on Monday. Of course, Handel's most famous oratorio is Messiah. Messiah was written in 1741, and it's kind of interesting because it's different than his other oratorios. A typical Handel oratorio is based on the Old Testament and is a complete narrative. He tells the entire story from whatever um, chapter in the Bible that he uh, extracted the story from. Messiah is not a chronological story, not like a, a screenplay. Instead, it's just a series of movements that are related, but they're not directly connected. It's more a um, musing on the New Testament. So that's the biggest difference to me, is most of Handel's oratorios are Old Testament. Messiah, of course, and obviously, is New Testament. And instead of being a complete story, it's just a series of separate little stories, if you will. Um, talking about Christianity. The music, it has a French overture. The recitatives and arias are very much in the Italian style. There are uh, fugues for chorus. 
which are very much in the German style, and he even absorbs some of that style of English anthems. The, uh, remember, if you think of the um, anthem, which was the English version of a motet, which began when the Anglican Church was founded uh, during the Renaissance. Handel's oratorios were performed frequently in London. I have a picture of myself somewhere standing. I was in, in uh, Ireland, and Messiah was world premiered in Dublin, Ireland. And I have a picture of myself standing in front of the historical marker. Uh, my brother used to live in Ireland, and I went over to visit him a few times. Standing in front of the uh, historical marker where the uh, place where Messiah was first premiered. Now that church, I think, has been torn down, but there is a historical marker there. Oratorios were a lot cheaper to produce than opera. You didn't need stages, staging, you didn't need sets, you didn't need costumes. So oratorios are much more cost effective to perform. He also wrote them in English, and Handel used English singers instead of Italian singers. The Italian opera singers got paid a lot more. So, and then finally, the oratorios, they were very popular among the middle class, so he had no problems at all selling tickets to these performances. So the oratorios that Handel wrote were actually much more cost effective than the operas that he had been staging. Instrumental music. As I mentioned, he wrote a lot of uh, concertos, uh, he wrote trio sonatas, he wrote orchestral music, um, he wrote harpsichord suites, probably the most famous of which is titled The Harmonious Blacksmith, solo sonatas, trio sonatas, but his most popular instrumental works, most famous instrumental works, are two suites for orchestra. The first one is called Water Music, and that was written to be performed um, this great royal gathering outdoors at the Thames River, uh, which is the big river that flows through London. And the musicians were actually on barges. The barges were anchored in the river, and the musicians were uh, up on those. Uh, 1749, he wrote more orchestral music titled Music for the Royal Fireworks. That's pretty self-explanatory. They were written, It was written as music to be played during a great uh, outdoor festival of fireworks. Handel lived in England from 1710 until the end of his life, and he was considered by the English to be the greatest English composer, although he wasn't English. He's buried in Westminster Abbey, which is the Royal Cathedral in London, same place where Henry Purcell is buried. Um, the amazing thing about Handel's oratorios is it's one of the few pieces of music, classes of music, that have never not been played. We've talked about this. Almost every composer who's ever written music, their music went through a period where people weren't playing it. Usually the period immediately after the composer's death, that music was no longer being performed. Handel's oratorios, there's never been a period in time when they've not been performed. They were performed during his lifetime, but even after Handel died, choruses immediately started performing his oratorios, or continued to perform his oratorios. And in the 1800s, they actually founded choruses for the sole purpose of performing Handel's oratorios. So there's never been a period of time when Handel's oratorios have not been in the repertoire. This is actually Handel's um, sculpture of Handel at his grave at Westminster Abbey. Okay, that finishes the slideshow. Uh, there will be, a, I believe, a short quiz posted up on Blackboard, of course. And in class on Monday, we're going to listen to a Bach cantata and then we're also going to listen to movements from uh, Handel Oratorio, and uh, I'm going to show you a video of Handel's Royal Fireworks music as well. At the end of class Monday, I'm going to pass out the exam. It will be due in class on Friday the 